Now that we know a little bit about truth table logic, let's turn our attention to, to an interesting application. I pulled this definition from Wikipedia. It says digital electronic circuits are usually made from large assemblies of logic gates, which are simple electronic representations of Boolean logic functions. So the things we've been studying so far can be essentially hardwired into everything that we use today with our electronics, your iPod, your flat screen TV, uh, your car, um, just everything in your life, smartphones, all work because of these integrated circuits or digital circuits that are, that are um, built into your electronics and miniaturized so that you can have so much logic design in such a small uh, surface area. We're not going very deeply into this, but I just want to give you a little taste of how what we're studying actually uh, makes a huge difference in your everyday life. Start off with an idea of a basic circuit that has a gate that can open and close. So I'm picturing, at least in my mind, something like that. And you might want to think of it as a for our purposes is just a wire that might conduct electricity and it has that gate that can be opened or closed. Um, when you picture it, you usually picture it as being open so you can actually see that the gate is there, but that gate can actually open or close. Now, this can get very complicated, but we're going to keep it very simple. In terms of what we're going to do, we're going to have two types of gates. One type form something we call a circuit in series. And that's when you have gates that are lined up in a row. Those are called circuits in series. So if you have a gate, we'll give them names for a convenience, say P and Q. So say we have gates P and Q and they're lined up in a row or in series. If you want to think, go back to our wire with the electricity flowing through analogy. Current will only flow all the way from the starting point to the ending point if both gates are closed. The only way current will, will get from here to here is for both, both gates to be closed. It's pretty easy to see. If we associate an open gate with the idea of a false statement. In other words, if that gate is open, we associate that with a, with a false statement. And if the gate is closed, we associate that with a true statement. So if that gate is closed, we would associate that with a true statement. Then that circuit in series is equivalent to our AND statement that we just studied because AND, as you remember, is only true if they're both true in the sense that I could say current will flow through only if both gates are closed. So if I equate closed to true, then this series circuit behaves in the same way as our logical statement with an AND. The second type of circuit we'll talk about is a circuit in parallel. This time, the circuit P and the circuit Q are parallel to each other. They're not on a line together. One is above the other. That's called a circuit in parallel. And so you think of uh, this is being the starting point for your current. Maybe you think of it being a battery even over here. You've got a battery over here and maybe a light bulb over here. And you want to know when will that light bulb light up. Well, with a parallel circuit, if this gate is closed and it doesn't matter what Q does because the current will just go up and around. 
like this. On the other hand, if Q is closed, it doesn't really matter what P does because the current can go around this way and light up the light bulb. If you think about it a minute, the only way to stop the current from flowing from the starting point to the ending point is to open both gates. Now think back to your logical statements. If we think again of open as being false and closed as being true, then this is the same as the OR statement. Current will only not flow if both gates are open. That's equivalent to saying for an OR that an OR is false only if both statements are false. So what we've shown here with this is that we can think of these logical circuit series or parallel as ands or ors. And with that, we can analyze more complex circuits. In other words, you can take a whole circuit board and imprint these circuit designs and make it as complex as you like by putting all of these gates together and forming uh, with these ands and ors parallel and in series circuits. And again, we're not getting deeply into this. You could easily study this for a whole semester or longer. We're simply touching the surface. But take this as an example. If I want to analyze it, I want to look at it in pieces. This is really made up of two pieces. The top piece is a parallel circuit because you've got P sitting above the Q, or in this case, the negation of Q. So that is the same, and we said a parallel is the same as an OR. So if I call that whole big thing, this the thing I've got in the box, that, that parallel circuit, suppose I call it capital A just so I can focus on it. Then capital A, which is the parallel circuit, is an OR, and you're ORing this statement, P, goes here with this statement, not Q. So that would go here. So you're ORing the top, which is a P, and the bottom, which is not Q. Now let's jump to the bottom. The bottom is also a parallel circuit. It could have been a um, circuit in series. In this particular example, I just made it a, another parallel circuit. So it's another OR. I said I could have made that into a uh, series in series circuit. Just didn't do it this time. We'll do some more examples later and see how that varies. So it's, it'll be the same thing. Suppose we call that capital B, so, so you can focus on it. Again, that is an OR because this, the circuits are in parallel. The top statement is a is the negation of R, so that goes here. The bottom statement is, is P, that goes here. And as I said, since it's a parallel circuit, it is an OR. Now looking at those, how are they connected? Well, the A circuit sits above the B circuit, so that those two circuits themselves are OR together. Since A sits above B, are parallel to B, that's another OR. Remember the OR is the circuit in parallel. So this piece comes from the top parallel circuit. This piece comes from the bottom parallel circuit. And this OR here reflects the fact that A and B themselves are in parallel. Now, you can go to some of the practice exercises that I will do later to see some variations on that. I did everything in this problem with parallels. It doesn't have to be that way. So you'll see some more problems where you've got some uh, more complicated or at least some more varied circuits involved in the circuit design. But the bottom line is I have now represented this logical circuit 
as a logical statement such as we studied earlier. And you can do it in reverse. You can start off with the logical statement and build the circuit. Now we're being asked to continue. This is the same problem we were solving before and this is the circuit that we began with. But now they're asking us something else. They want to know which statement below is equivalent to the one above. So they want us to take this statement that we started with and they want us to figure out which one of these four statements it's equivalent to. This is really going back to what we were doing earlier. It doesn't in particular have anything to do with circuit design, but it's part of the question where the first part did have something to do with circuit design. So it's a good exercise. In order to find out whether two statements are equivalent, as we discussed earlier, you can look at their truth tables, and if they have exactly the same truth values all the way through, they're exactly identical truth tables, then the two statements are, are going to be logically equivalent. Remember though, we know that we can tell how many rows a truth table will have by looking at how many simple statements there are in the logical expression. And if you notice here, there's a P, there's a Q, and there's an R. So we've done truth tables with two rows. That's when it only had a P in it. Two to the one is two. We've done logical uh, statements and there are truth tables where there were two, like a P and a Q, and that's two to the two is four. But this is three. So they're going to be two to the third, that's two times two times two, is equal to eight rows in the truth table. Now, the thing is, if I did a truth table for part A and did eight rows, and then B and did eight rows, and then C and did eight rows, and then D and did eight rows, if the answer were D, I would be doing possibly as many as 32 rows of truth table rows in order to figure this out. That's obviously going to take a long time, so I suggest a different strategy. In order to prove that two things are not equivalent, all you've got to do is find one row where they differ. So if only one of these answers is equivalent to the original problem, all I have to do is find three that aren't. So I should be able to just start out and maybe try a row and see what that eliminates, and if it doesn't get rid of all the other possibilities, try it again. So I'm going to try to shorten the process by uh, thinking smartly and just picking out some values of P, Q, and R and trying to find um, differing values so I can eliminate a choice. In other words, I'm just going to pick one row of the table. And why not just try for all of them being true? Remember, there are eight rows, and I'm going to try true, 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 and just see if that gives me anything. So what happens if I let P, Q, and R be true? Well, first of all, I want to see what it does to the original statement. If I let P be true, and Q be true, and R be true, I get this. And if I simplify that, all the not trues become false. Then I've got two ors. The first one is a true or with the false, which we know by now is going to be true because an or is only false if they're both false. And then the same thing over here is another or, so it's only false if they're both false. So now I end up with a true union with a true, which is uh, true. So the original statement is true. Now that we know that the original statement is true when all three P, Q, and R are true, now we want to do the same thing for our possible uh, equivalent statements to see if we can get one to come out false. If we do, we can eliminate that one. So that's the strategy. I'm hoping to get some falses when I go down this list, A, B, C, D, and then if so, I can eliminate any false results. So let's start off with the first one. 
Remember, I'm still putting in true for P, Q, and R. So I'll put true, true, true in. Notice that not true is false. And I'm ending a false and a true. And an and is only true if they're both true. So that would be false. And now I'm oring a true and a false. And an or is only false if they're both false. So that's true. So unfortunately, a still is a possibility because it came out to be true. They match up. So that could still be a possible answer. Still possible. I don't know that it's equivalent, but it's still possibly equivalent. So I'll move down to B. Again, I'm putting in all trues. But I do notice that not true is false. And then I'm oring two falses, which is false. And then I'm oring a false and a true, which is true. Well, unfortunately, here I go again. I have a match again. A and B both come out true, which is what the original statement was. So I haven't eliminated anything. I'm halfway through. Hope I get luckier. So I move to C, putting in all trues. Again, noticing that not true is false. I'm oring a true and a false, which is true. And then I'm ending a true and a false, which is false. Finally, I've gotten one that doesn't match. So that means C can't possibly be equivalent to the original statement. So I can eliminate C. Let's move to D and see what happens. Plugging again, all trues in, noticing that not true is false. And then I'm ending a true and a false, which is false. And then I'm oring two falses, which is false. Luckily again, I got one to disagree. So D cannot possibly be equivalent to the original statement, so I can eliminate that. So I've gone through A, B, C, and D, and I've gotten rid of half my possibilities. So the only two that are still possible are choices A and B. Well, what do I do? I still have two possibilities. Remember, there are um, eight rows to a true table with three simple statements, and I've only done one. I did all trues. So I've got to pick another one and see if I can get one to eliminate. What comes to mind to me is if I tried all trues, why not try the one with all falses? There's still two possibilities, and I have to narrow down. So you can pick any other row besides all trues, but I think I'll try all falses, just because it seems easier. I've got to reevaluate the original expression first, because uh, I'm going to test A and B to see if they come out true and false, but I've got to compare it to what the original statement comes out to be. So I have to first try it in the original statement. So if I put all falses into the original statement, I get that. And then I notice that I've got some not falses that can be changed to trues. And then I'm oring a false with a true and a true with a false. And I know false or true is true. And I know that a true or false is also true. I'm oring two trues and true or true is true. So as with the other one, this statement is also true. If P, Q, and R are all false, the original statement comes out true. So now when I'm going back down to A and B, I again am looking for a false. Had the original statement come out to be false, I'd be looking for a true to try to eliminate a possibility. But uh, for better or for worse, it came out true with all falses as well. So when I plug in all falses for each of these, one of them, I hope, will come out false so that I can eliminate it. If not, I have to go to a third row of the truth table, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and then a sixth, and then a seventh, and if I'm really unlucky, an eighth. I'm hoping it'll happen this time. So let's see. Start off with the putting all Fs in for A. When I do that, I notice I have a not false, which I can make into a true. Then I'm anding a true with a false, which is false. And finally, I'm oring two falses, which is false. So, lucky day. I found a false when I was really looking for a true. So that means A can't possibly be right. So, if I have not made any mistakes, there's only one choice left, and that's choice B. So that must be the right answer.
Here in particular, you've done a lot of work, and if you make one mistake, it can throw you off. It's just a word of warning. Be very, very careful, slow, and deliberate as you're doing these type of problems.